Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter. My name is Rebecca, and I'm one of the elders here, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to St. Andrews this morning. I'm not going to belabor you with too many announcements, except that it is wonderful to bring the good news. He is risen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, the lilies here are in memory of those who are with us in spirit this morning, um, and a reminder that love is stronger than death. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are visitors joining us for the first time this morning, you are very welcome. And for those of you whose faces we haven't seen in a long time, it's wonderful to be amongst you again. And come back. On the first day of the week that the women went to the tomb where Jesus had been buried only to find that the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty. Friends, we gather today as Christ's own disciples on this first day of the week to celebrate the good news of the gospel, that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Our first hymn as we celebrate is number 243, Jesus Christ is Risen Today.
Let us pray together. We come rejoicing, God, on this morning, this first day of the week, that as a new day begins, we have come, arriving at last at this sacred day, this eternal moment, when all things that separate us from you are rolled away, when the glory of your love blazes forth and we know that nothing in this world or the world to come can separate us now from the love of Christ. The ways of your kingdom stretch out before us. Hope stirs anew in our hearts. And we ask that you would open our eyes this morning, God, to your invitation to walk in newness of life, to embrace the healing and forgiveness you offer, the gifts of peace and love, and to extend them in our turn. For truly, we do confess that we can scarcely believe what we have heard. We can hardly believe our eyes. It is beyond our comprehension and perhaps not what we expected when we came to the tomb this morning. For the thing is that even after 2,000 years, Instead of going out into the world and looking for you, seeking to be part of what you are doing, we still come on Easter morning, half expecting to see a dead body. Restore us this morning to the wonder and joy of salvation. Open our eyes to your steadfast presence among us. Remind us that this is not about anything we have done or who we are but rather that it has everything to do with what you have done and who you are in Jesus Christ. For he is risen, risen indeed. Alleluia, we say, and we continue to pray the words he teaches us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the good news, that what God had promised our ancestors, God has fulfilled for us, in the raising of Jesus from the dead. In him, God loves us with an everlasting and all-powerful love. A love so deep, so broad, so high, that even death cannot keep us from the love of God. Friends, this is forgiveness, that he rose, that he returned to us, and is with us always, that anyone who is in Christ might be a new creation. Thanks be to God. We're going to sing now hymn 256, Now the Green Blade Rises.
And you can have a seat here and just sit on the floor and keep the instruments where they are. You can sit here on the floor here and we're gonna have a little talk today. It is so nice to see you all here. You can have a seat right here. Awesome. It is so cool to see so many of you here today. Happy Easter. Will you raise your hand for me if you have had any chocolate already today? Uh -huh. Raise your hand if you have had any candy today already. Raise your hand if you have had any kind of surprise today. Maybe. Did you guys hear that? I know you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified, but he is not here, for he has been raised. <gasps> wow, an angel, come to share good news with us. Thank you so much, angel. What a surprise. <laughs> a surprise to see that angel come out of, do you know what that is there? It's supposed to be a... A cave. A cave, that's right, a cave or a tomb. When Jesus died, they laid him in a tomb, and he was dead for three days, but the big surprise was that he came alive again. And an angel came and told the people who came to see him to take care of his body that he was alive and that he had good news for them to share with people. It was a great surprise for them that Jesus was alive when they thought he was dead. It was a great surprise that they had good news to tell people about God's love all over. And it was a surprise that God's love was still there for them even after all that had happened. I would like you to make a cave with your hand. Can you make a tomb with your hand like this? And can you make a rock with your other hand and put the rock in front of the cave? And we'll do this for our prayer. You say a line and say it after me. <clears throat> and at the end of the prayer, you move your stone away from the tomb. So repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God thank, you for Jesus thank you for Jesus and the surprises he brings, and the surprises he brings. Not, just at Easter, not just at Easter, but every day. But every day. Help us to share your love and joy, joy. every day. Every day. Amen. Amen. You're welcome to come with me for Sunday school today. You can follow me, and parents are welcome to come, but there is also children's supervision. We go through here, and there is a, a coffee hour at the end out these doors, and you can find your children there at the end of the service.
Let us pray. Living God, by your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see the new light of this day. Open our lips to tell of the empty tomb and open our hearts to believe the good news. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My name is Michael Noth, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version that's in the pew in front of you. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 65, verses 18 to 25, found on page 706 in the Old Testament. <clears throat> but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating, for I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit, and they shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for there shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. But the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Our second reading is from Matthew in the New Testament, chapter 28, verses 1 to 10, found on page 32 of the Pew Bible. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guard shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has been raised from the dead, and indeed he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. And so they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, greetings, and they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers and sisters to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. Two fifty five, now let the vault of heaven resound.
It was in the quiet and in the darkness where we cannot see, let alone understand, that the mystery of the resurrection happened and Easter arrived. The love of God reaching from beyond the violence of the cross, reaching from beyond the betrayal and the denial and the abandonment of friends, reaching from beyond death itself to claim the world back as God's own and beloved. This is Easter, the bringing of life and hope, the assurance that violence and death do not win, and that everything that separates us from God and each other, all creation, can be and is overcome. This is the good news of the resurrection, an earth-shaking experience, as the Gospel of Matthew records it this morning. Earthquake, noise, loudness, the beauty of Easter arriving as a thunderous expression of joy and hope that we did not and could not see coming. It was the last thing they were expecting, I'm sure. Jesus had died around three in the afternoon on Friday. He was buried very quickly before sunset when the Sabbath began. There were only a few people there when his body was laid in the tomb. Not the disciples, they had fled in terror at Jesus' arrest the night before. They were nowhere to be seen. At his burial, there was a man, Joseph of Arimathea, who were told is rich and a member of the council and a secret disciple who is lending his own tomb for the purpose. And another man, Nicodemus. And then some of the women who Luke's gospel tells us were the same ones who had been with Jesus throughout his ministry. They had been with him since his days in Galilee, providing for him out of their purse. They had been there at the cross, and they were the ones who were there when his tortured body was laid in the tomb. A lot of them, you might have noticed, were called Mary. There were a lot of Marys back then. It was... Well, it was a way of remembering and naming young girls after the sister of Moses, Miriam, Mary, it's the same name. It was a remembering and celebrating the life of a young girl who, even when she was very young, had protected her brother's own life against the powers of a, a king that would have destroyed him and whose own song and expression of joy at her people's deliverance from slavery has been remembered down through the ages. <laughs> All these Marys, they carry on her tradition. Mary Magdalene, I don't know if the Mary today, um, she was one of them. Legend, legend and culture have a lot to say about Mary Magdalene. The Bible itself doesn't say much just that she had once been healed by Jesus of seven demons. So, so whether she was the prostitute she sometimes talked about as being or a woman of disrepute, truthfully, what it was she was cured of, we don't know. And it really doesn't matter at all because what does matter, what does matter, is that her life had been changed by Jesus. In him, she had experienced some kind of healing and restoration, so that the very things she lived and hoped for were different because he was in her life. She lived entirely differently than she had before because he had come into her being. And as she and the other women watched Jesus put into the tomb, I can't imagine what that was like. Everything that she had come to hope and dream about, did it feel like they were being laid to rest as well? How could this have happened? Is this real? So the questions we all ask when tragedy just strikes. Oh, that I could wake up and it was a bad dream. <laughs> How could Jesus, beloved friend, with all that he promised, all that he gave, be gone. 
those storms he'd calmed, the bodies he'd healed, the eyes he'd opened, the hungers he'd fed, all those lives like hers made new. The way that Jesus had reached out to those the world would have rejected and drawn them into the love of God, he had awoken such wonder, such promise among those who followed him. The women had been with him in Galilee. They'd come with him to Jerusalem. They'd seen how the crowds adored him last Sunday. They saw as well how the rulers feared and hated him. They'd been there when the crowd turned against him. They'd probably seen him arrested, the disciples leaving him. And the next time they saw Jesus was probably when he was hanging high on that cross between two criminals, mocked, tortured. Hours they would have stayed there, hoping, I think, that God would do something (laughs) to intervene. And then the last breath left Jesus' body. And they could almost feel the hope leave theirs. They had felt so much, and now it felt like everything was over, horribly and quickly. And as they looked out at the world, the wonder Jesus had brought to it was gone. Night had fallen quickly after his burial. The Sabbath had come, but I can't imagine it was a restful one. A day passed. Can imagine them lying through the second night, trying to sleep. That feeling, I think, can I close my eyes? Do I will it play over again? What what can I trust now? Can I even pray in moments like that? They're hard. And so they'd gotten up early (laughs) and they'd gone out to the tomb, maybe just to be as close as they could. And then the angel, and the earthquake, and the stone rolled back, and the angel speaking to them, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. It was the last thing they were expecting, I'm sure. It almost always is resurrection. Came upon them like grace reaching out from beyond themselves, speaking hope into a place where hope had seemed to gone, to be gone, offering to make everything new again just when it really felt like everything was finished. That's the beauty of the resurrection. It's like being born again being thrust into the world where things that are otherwise impossible become real and our understanding of how things are has to be reordered, our way of living and looking and relating to each other. It has to change once the resurrection happens. As as human beings, I think it's fair to assume we all know something of the reality of the separation the women experienced on Good Friday. Paul Tillich once said, this is the definition of sin. Before sin is ever an action or anything we do, it's a state of separation. That how, no matter where we are or what we're doing, there's always a a gap, a separation between us and other people, us and God, us and even within ourselves. It's that feeling of being alone sometimes when you're in a crowd and and you feel people don't really know what you're thinking. It's that moment when even in the presence of your best friend, you want to assert yourself over them at their expense to put yourself forward and you don't want to say it, but And it's in that time when we, that we all experience that, the, the stories we see on the news, the things that are happening in the world, the, the tragedies and the wars and the climate change in Ukraine. And 
and they disturb us as we watch them, and then, and then we live our own life most of the time like it's not happening to someone else somewhere else, and that separation is there, and, and it's there between us and others as individuals, it's between nations, as they struggle and, and sometimes end up in war, it's between us and creation. The, the struggle within ourselves, it leaves us kind of separated from our very selves too, right? The sense of, of somehow being separated from who it is we really are called to become and be. Our own ability to love and trust ourselves and others and the world and God is all, all comes out of this separation. <laughs> and that is what Jesus entered into on Good Friday on the cross. As the world threw its worst at him and judged him, He went into the places of deepest abandonment, deepest separation that exist within us, between human beings, between us and God. And he went there. And that's what happened on Good Friday. We discovered that there actually is nowhere, no separation between us that God cannot enter, that God will not go into to bring us home to ourselves and each other and God and the world. And that, that is the love that gave rise to the resurrection that, that raised Jesus from the dead. It is the, the power that, that reached beyond all those things, the violence of the cross, the abandonment of friends, the the power of death itself, which is the ultimate separation, and brought us all back home. Grace, ultimate grace, quote Paul Tillich again. He said, sometimes we, we feel it like this. It breaks through everything else, and, and we feel it like a ray of light, a reunion of life with life, a reconciliation and overcoming The estrangement between us, it, it is overcome. And it comes to us, not because of anything we've done or because we forced it, it can come to us like light in the midst of darkness. This assurance, assurance of this love that is so powerful that nothing can withstand it. A long time ago, this happened to me, and maybe it's happened to you. I had an argument with a friend. Well, I mean, it happens other times, too. But it was the kind of argument where things got nasty and defensive, and we became really uncomfortable with each other. And in the days that follow, we went out of the way to avoid each other. And sometimes we couldn't because we had friends in common, but there was always something there between us. It was like this great stone or a chasm that separation, estrangement. And then one day I ran into her and she looked at me and she said, why don't you come over? And I did. And, and when I knocked on the door and she answered, her face was half surprise, half welcome. <laughs> I didn't think you'd really come, she said. But that's what she said later. In that moment, she just said, come in and have tea. And there was this moment of wholeness and wellness as the door opened and the threshold crossed and the Bitterness and resentment and anger faded. And in that moment, you could feel something restored and forgiven and whole again. And, and so worthy of celebration. And Easter, that is what Easter is like. It is the invitation to newness, the starting over, the, the becoming again, all things becoming possible, and ushering in of new life and new possibilities. And yeah, while separation and estrangement and sin still abound in this world, the good news of Easter is that love 
and grace, they abound even more. God reaching out from beyond us, from beyond all that separates us, and claiming the world again. It is incredible good news. It tells us that violence did not triumph. (laughs) Death did not triumph. Betrayal and abandonment did not have the final word. The world is turned upside down. And even though Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, it's not an ending. It's a new beginning. Through the ages, people of faith have held fast to this trust we have in the resurrecting power of God to reach from beyond the cross, to reach from beyond death, to reach from beyond all things that separate and bring us home. This is the foundation of Christian hope. It is from this bedrock that that we stand up to protest evil because we know this is not what we're made from. It's, It's what brings us to sit with those who are suffering. It brings us through our own suffering as well. It is hope for today and tomorrow and next year and 10 years from now, even today, with war and climate change. And and so many things dividing people. Easter, grace, the assurance of, of God overcoming all things. This is the answer. This is where we put our hope, and this is where we start to live again. Every year, I think what really gets to me what really speaks to me is not just that, that Jesus rose again, that death could not keep him down, but that he returned, that he came back to us, that he dwells with us, that the tomb was opened for us. <laughs> we can try to explain the good news of Easter. I don't know if we can, we try but it's the best news any of us will ever hear and experience. It's that moment when when we feel ourselves drawn back into life and hope and living, when we know we're not alone, when we feel restored to who we are and to our relationships with ourselves, each other, the world, and God. It's the invitation to new life, and it's ascending because that's what happens. You don't just get to sit there and enjoy it, though you do. Go, the angel said, and look for him. Because he is alive, he's not here, he's out there, and wherever you go, you will find him. They're sent to Galilee, to the places where Jesus has always done his ministry, where he's continues to erase the boundaries between people, where he continues to erase the boundary between life and death, wherever people need him. There he is. May you see him as you go this week. May you experience the grace and love of Jesus, for Christ is risen, and he is risen indeed. Hallelujah.
holy. Holy, holy God, crucified and resurrected Jesus, life-giving and redeeming spirit. We praise and give you thanks this morning, full of awe and wonder that because Jesus lived and died and lives again, we find ourselves standing at the beginning of a new life, able once more to put our trust in you and your promises, fashioned, becoming a resurrection people over whom death and sin have no power. And we come to you, lifting up our hearts and bringing you our prayers, Easter God, for your church all around the world this day. That as we celebrate your love that raised Jesus from the dead, we too may grow in the power of his love and walk in newness of life. We pray for our planet, this good earth, that together those who dwell in it might be good stewards of the life it provides, that all may share in its abundance the beauty of creation. We pray for governments and nations of this world, those who have power in their decisions to profoundly affect the lives of others, that they may be wise in leadership, humble in service, kind, fearless in the face of evil. We pray for people who are living in poverty and those who are without home, that they might receive welcome and refuge, hope and hospitality. We pray for people who are ill or in distress, that they might find healing for their pain and be restored to the fullness of life you promise. We pray for our loved ones who have died and who are with you, who we look forward to glad reunion with in the life to come. We thank you for the stories of their lives that continue to live in ours and for the hope and promise you offer the death itself is not forever in the way. We pray for our neighbors that together we might live in harmony and seek the well-being of each other. We pray for those who we might call enemy or who oppose us or who disagree with us, that we might love each other, forgive each other. You have given us, almighty God, you have given us life in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray for ourselves, for this new life among us, that we will be tender with each other and ourselves that drawing close to you, we might find ourselves ever closer to each other, offering together hearts and lives to your service in the name of Jesus. Amen. Morning, everyone. My name is Craig, and I'm speaking with you at this time because I'm one of the handful of authors of the financial quarterly update that uh, you receive, surprisingly quarterly. Uh, that's written together with Barbara and Don, with Thomas, as well as Norrell. And friends, uh, at this time, I would like for you to, to share some of your blessings with us so that this church as a community can share those blessings with others, that we can bring joy and comfort, salvation in the word of God uh, to our neighbors and our community. There's a hymn, listening to the music today, uh, it reminds me when I was younger, there was a hymn, it's called The Old 100 or The Doxology, and it starts by reminding us that all blessings flow from God. So everything that we receive comes in part from God, so I'm inviting you to share some of that uh, today. The Doxology True was written in 1634, but we are a 21st century church. Uh, we realize, like me, I don't carry cash or checks. I know my parents did. I don't understand them sometimes. Uh, so we do have a whole series of electronic means which you can find on our website if you'd like to consider doing so following the service. 
Uh, but during the service, the ushers will come around in our traditional way with our plates, and you are invited to provide through those cash or check means, or if you'd like to provide later, just nod your head, give them an acknowledgement, or we do have these guest envelopes which you can drop into the plate empty. We will not be offended. Please do. Thank you very much. And thank you for your continued support all year round for all the, the joy that you're bringing in the Word of God as you see today. Thank you. We pray, God, as you 
gathered us here and we bring you our gifts. We ask that you would bless these things, but bless us in our living as well, that we might bear witness to the living Christ among us in all we do and say. Amen. I ask you to stay standing. Our final responsive reading is in the bulletin. It's um, it says Easter on one side. On the other, under the part Christ is risen, it tells of some of the ways that our denomination works to bear witness to the living Christ through our mission branch of the church. But on the other is our closing response, after which our final hymn is printed in the bulletin this morning. So here we go. Christ is risen. The tomb is empty. Rising from the grave, Jesus brings life to all the wrong places. Rising from the grave, Jesus brings life to all the wrong people. Christ's resurrection means that we are no longer lost in the wilderness. The world has been turned upside down. Life has defeated death. Hope has overwhelmed despair. Joy has conquered gloom. Amen.
God who gathered us in here together this day to hear proclaimed the good news that Christ is risen is the same God who sends us now out into the world. Christ has gone before you. And as you go this week, may you see his face in those you meet. May they see the image of God in you as you go now in the name of God, the everlasting and life-giving love of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.